right view as right orientation. Um, so I have a lot of respect for the eightfold path as a, in a, the, the linear sense of it, which is perhaps less popular as a, as a framework for lifelong practice and uh, you know starting off going through the um, uh, right view, um, then um, oh, we lost someone. Uh, right view and then uh, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right um, uh, mindfulness, and uh, and right concentration. And uh, this is the framework that I use for thinking through my own uh, my own practice. And I. Um, uh, so we focus on right view, and there's in some ways right view is also the final path because right view in the sense of seeing reality as it is before concept, before words, and so forth, and um, a lot of um, and so in that final sense of, of right view, I mean it's often the way that Zen teachers in particular will write about it. You know, when Sing, Sung San or, or Thich Nhat Han talk about right view, it's often the sense that they're uh, they're talking about it, but there's also, I find, some very important or helpful ways of thinking about right view in that initial step in the Eightfold Path. Um, in fact, two ways. I mean, one simple one is just right view in the sense of learning basic concepts and terminology, at least in your tradition, so you know what your teachers and books and stuff are talking about. So, you know, you should probably have a general idea of what uh, emptiness is or um, dependent origination, right? But I think there's the thing I want to focus on is um, this idea of right view as, um, as an orientation to um, to these concepts and towards our, our practice. Uh, and I think going back to Siddhartha himself, all the way from the beginning seems to be this emphasis on uh, this, this orientation of uh, non-attachment non to views, of skepticism and pragmatism that I value so much in, in Buddhism. There's um, in the, um, there, there's uh, the Book of Eights, which is, uh, many scholars argue, is like one of the as one of the best cases for being among the oldest uh, Buddhist texts, that these were these collection of poems were very likely uh, circulating, perhaps even during Siddhartha's uh, ministry before he even uh, even died. And in there, a bunch of these poems are all about you know, not being attached to views. Where uh, it's like, oh, you know, if you you know stop arguing about metaphysics, you know, you go over to the other group over there, you start arguing with them, and then you get upset when you get out debated, or you get all riled up and you get attached to these views, and and it just it inflames your sense of self and your your ego and so forth. And I'm right, and they're wrong. We're superior, they're inferior. So you just don't get don't get attached to these things. It's just going to make you miserable. Um, but part of the problem with this attachment to views is it also kind of misses the point about about views that <clears throat> the way that concepts are always inherently partial they can never encompass uh the reality even if it's just because of the limitations of language and their inability to to um encompass uh reality and uh, of course we get from the Pali canon right, the most famous parable from anything in buddhism about the the blind subjects and the an elephant even people who aren't buddhists know know this one and the king calls in the folks who've been blind from birth and he gives them different parts of the elephant to check out and the guy who checks out the, the the body is like oh the elephants are like great storerooms and the one who grabs the head is says they're like uh they, like water jars or something and they get so upset with each other saying different things that they collapse into a fist fight right i mean that's just the nature of these they're always partial you know it's not that the head part was wrong i mean it's just it's just our grasp of reality is always always partial. So of course we should be skeptical of views and not confuse them with reality. Uh, and there's a great story of him going to the Kalama village and they're like, hey, all these folks come through and they're saying, oh, this is the way it is and this is the nature of the cosmos and there's other folks you're talking to, they're all wrong. Hey, uh, Siddhartha, you know, who should we, you know, who should we trust? And he's like, you're totally right to be skeptical of, of these folks. Don't listen to any of them. Don't, doesn't matter. Don't believe something just because your teacher says it, because a book says it, because, um, because through logic, it seems to be the, the right thing. And it's really interesting. The example he picks out of there is a really practical one. He, he says uh, about, oh, you're getting all these teachings about what sort of behaviors not to do, right? And so it's not about some metaphysical thing. He brings it back to the practical, that pragmatic aspect. And, he's, and he then leads us through the process of thinking through this. And, and like, oh, based on your own experience, you know you shouldn't do these things because they make you and other people miserable, right? That's the reason why you accept accept that not because you know your teacher or, or you know some claim to authority uh says it 
Um, so it inculcates that skepticism from the beginning. And I love that example in the, the Kalama uh, village case because it's pragmatic, because I think that gets at the other feature of this orientation um, that at least Siddhartha was bringing his students to, that, that pragmatism uh, of it, that it was about, uh, about actions in the world. Um, and the, um, and see in um, the idea of upaya, uh, skillful means as well, which, which is not just, the, you know, it's big in the Lotus Sutra, but it's also all over the, the Pali Canon uh, as well. And it provides the parable of the burning house, you know, the big mansion, and the guy's got dozens of kids in there, and they're all playing, the house catches on fire. He goes, hey, kids, you got a house on fire? And they're like, yeah, you know, whatever, old man. Uh, and they, they keep playing, they don't believe him. And like, how do I get these kids out of here? He thinks of all these things. And I'm just like, I know, I'll tell them. I got a whole bunch of these great gifts for you, your favorite things, which are these vehicles pulled by all these wonder, wondrous animals. And they're like, all right, great. And they run out of the house, all right? It worked, right? So did he lie? Well, in this case, it turns out he's a very rich man. He can buy the carriages for the kids anyway. And it turns out it's all an analogy anyway. The mansion is, is our experience of the world. We're the kids. So to always use fire uh, as the, to represent um, craving uh, and, it, and its dangers. And the vehicles, the different vehicles are the various teachings. Use whichever one is gonna pull you out of the fire. Because that's the only thing that matters. It's, it's the pragmatism. Um, the concepts are tools. Uh, and sometimes you need a hammer, sometimes you need needle and thread. Don't use needle and thread when you, what you really need is hammer. And when you need a hammer, use the hammer and put it down and move on, right? Because they're just there to, to pound in nails. Um, and so the teachings are, are, are um, just practical. Um, a great story again from the Pali Canon about the, the poison arrow. Guy gets shot with a poison arrow and uh, his friends and family call a doctor. A doctor comes over and Siddhartha says, says to the students, now imagine if you get shot with an arrow and you respond, hey doctor, you can't pull this thing out until you tell me um, how tall the guy was who shot me, um, what clan he belonged to, who his grandparents were, right? By the time you can finish asking the questions, let alone getting the answers to them, you've already died, right? The important thing is just pull out the damn arrow and treat, get the poison out and, and treat the, the wound, right? And, and then I love this, he goes on to then say, you know, have, did I ever teach you crap about like, oh, the nature of the cosmos is eternal or the nature of the cosmos is cyclical or, or I forget the examples. And I'm like, no, you, of course you haven't done that. And he's like, and why don't I do that? Well, because, because, well, you'll never know the answers to that before you end up dying. And the important thing is to cure the poison. And so what have I taught you? Oh, I've taught you things like, well, there's the satisfaction, the satisfaction or suffering. Uh, it has an origin. Um, it, you can, um, you can end it and there's a path to it, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, um, the path to, to Nirvana. Um, and so that is what he taught because it was useful. Um, so he told his students. Um, and so I love this idea of, of, um, that initial right view. So right view at the beginning of the path as opposed to the end. And in the beginning, right view as right orientation, the right way, because if you're going to, start off, you got to learn these terms and these concepts and stuff, but you got to have a right at orientation to it first or else, you know, you end up becoming attached to it and then you go over to the other song and you start yelling at people over there about them doing it wrong or whatever, and then everybody's miserable, you get kicked out. Um, so the skepticism, the pragmatism, not getting attached to views, I think these are all really helpful things for uh, starting off. And maybe some of the Mahayana, writers of the Mahayana scriptures might have benefit from this because you know how they're always attacking the Madhyamikas or the uh, uh, I forget the other the Sarvastivadins and and so forth like you know relax stop <laughs> stop fighting with the Sarvastivadins I'm sure they're they're fine um, <laughs> but uh, not a lot of them left anymore as far as I know um, but another thing we start with in, in Zen is Zazen right and here's our our first steps into that that final ultimate sense of of right view, which is seeing reality as it is, you know, before concept and before uh, language. Um, and so now it's time for uh, another round of right view. <laughs>